Hello and welcome to Ozpol Explained. I'm your curly haired host David and today I have a bit of a story about the beginning of Australia as a nation. Let's set the scene. The year is 1900 and Queen Victoria has given royal assent to the Australian Constitution. On New Year's Day 1901 it'll come into effect and create the Commonwealth of Australia. Soon someone will need to be chosen to be the very first Prime Minister of Australia. What could possibly go wrong? Let me tell you the story of a political controversy that was given its name even before it had happened, was resolved by Christmas Day, and the man who almost became the first Prime Minister of Australia. This is The Hopeton Blunder, Part 1. The Governor-General Arrives. Federation had taken many years to come about. There had been multiple constitutional conventions to shape this constitution. There had been referendums in all six of the colonies, sometimes multiple referendums, to decide whether or not Australia should unite as a country. New Zealand had decided not to join us, but that's okay. It would give us someone to compete with in the cricket. While Federation would happen on the 1st of January, the first election itself wouldn't be until March. How would Australia be governed until then? Simple, a caretaker government appointed by the Governor-General. We didn't have one at that point, so Queen Victoria decides to create the office and appoint Lord John Hope, the 7th Earl of Hopeton, to be the very first Governor-General of Australia. He'd previously been the Governor of Victoria from 1889 until 1895, so he'd already been to Australia, he's already fulfilled the viceregal role of being the monarch's representative. Surely, right, he'd know how to do the job properly, right? Back then, being a Governor or Governor-General was a job for British aristocrats, who would be shipped out from London to go look after a colony for a few years before then being given some other prestigious role. So Lord Hopeton and his wife get on a boat and arrived on the 15th of December 1900. This wasn't ideal because one, that was just over two weeks away from Federation, so time was ticking, and two, He'd gotten typhoid on the trip and his wife had gotten malaria on their way to Australia. So this whole journey was off to a very bad start for them. Oh, that sucks, genuinely. But at least the decision of choosing who would be the very first Prime Minister would be simple and straightforward because there was actually a precedent for this. Back in 1867, Canada had federated and the leader of the most populous colony had become the Prime Minister. So, basically, just repeat that idea and bada bing, bada boom, easy peasy, lemon squeezy, those sorts of idioms, it's going to be fine. While the journey itself had been harrowing, at least this one decision to kick off his career would be easy. Right? Part 2. The Governor General's Big Giant Mistake So, New South Wales was the oldest and the most populous colony, and... The New South Wales Premier was Sir William Lyne, so Lord Hopeton figured 2 plus 2, simple. He asked Lyne to be the very first Prime Minister of Australia. There's just one problem with this. William Lyne hadn't actually wanted Federation to happen. He'd actively campaigned against it. New South Wales had two referendums on the subject of Federation. Lyne had campaigned for the no side when the first one. Then most of the premiers had a private meeting where they discussed how could they make federation happen. This included some concessions and alterations to the constitution to make it more appealing to New South Wales. Despite that, Lyne still campaigned for the no side at the second referendum. So why give this man the honour of being the very first leader of a federal government that he'd personally fought to prevent existing in the first place. This was met with immediate scorn, obviously. The Advertiser, a newspaper, labelled him as the mortal enemy of the Commonwealth Bill. The Maitland Daily Mercury wrote, Lord Hopeton has made an irretrievable and almost ludicrous blunder. 
and criticize Line, saying he will be like a rudderless ship in a stormy sea, a weak and contemptible and narrow politician. Sir William will be in the place which only a strong man, a faithful Federalist, a man of large national mind can adequately fill. Who was that strong man meant to be? Part 3. Edmund Barton. Duh. Edmund Barton was a politician who had left the New South Wales Parliament back in March of that year. He'd also been a central figure in the Federation movement of the past decade. He'd been a delegate at the many constitutional conventions. He'd campaigned heavily for its success. He was known basically in the past few years as the leader of the Federation movement. And he'd also helped write the constitution itself. Really, the only better choice imaginable would have been Sir Henry Parks, the father of Federation himself. The only downside of that decision being that Parks had died four years prior and necromancy had yet to be invented. So, while Edmund Barton was no longer a member of Parliament, it was generally expected that he'd be the obvious choice. So much so that it was actually believed that Barton had already selected most of his cabinet in advance. Barton, however, would not comment on this, taking a step back to let the Governor-General do his job poorly. The Coolgardie Herald wrote in October on their prediction that it is curious that whenever the x-rays of anticipation are turned upon the opacity of the future, there is always revealed a rotund figure with unreadable, iron-grey hair, clear-cut features, and a clean-shaven face. There is a watch in the pocket attached to a chain from which there dangles a golden railway pass on which a name which begins with a capital B and ends with a small N. Barton. X-rays had been discovered only five years prior and apparently had made such a big impact on this writer that he decided to turn this report into a poetic musing about the future. X-rays were the new crystal ball, apparently. You know, the X-rays of anticipation, a phrase we're all familiar with, like the MRI of desire, or the CT scan of eagerness. I guess. The Manning River Times wrote two weeks before Lord Hopeton's arrival, as Lord Hopeton is an astute statesman, he is bound to be well informed as to the public man in Australia who is most likely to form a strong and popular federal executive. Would he then send for Sir William Lyne, who was an uncompromising opponent of the draft bill and the amended bill? Probably not, for he would understand that Sir William would fail to form a strong cabinet. The ministry would consist of Sir William Lyne and six mediocrities, and Lord Hopeton would know he had blundered at the beginning and would experience consequent humiliation. So it was obvious to people. Could you imagine him picking William Lyne? That would be just some kind of blunder. A Hopeton blunder, perhaps. Hey, that's a good name for a controversy. Gosh, I sure hope he doesn't do that thing that we all think is stupid in two weeks' time. Sure, Hopeton had been away from Australia for a few years, and he'd been sick on the boat journey here, so it's not like he had the strongest pulse on the politics of Australia. Is a bad excuse, I would say, because it's not like the UK was entirely removed from the goings-on of the soon-to-be nation. There's a thing called a telegraph where you communicate across distances. It's like the internet, but worse. The British colonial secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, was deeply confused by Hopeton's decision and sent a telegraph that read, Great surprise expressed at choice of line instead of Barton. Please give reasons. Oh, it always fills me with a little bit of terror whenever an authority figure asks me the question directly, Hey, why did you do that? Why? <laughs> so it seems that this very obvious and easy decision was very obviously easily uh, not meant to be line. But, part four, line tries anyway. He'd been given a commission on the 19th of December, and all he needed to do was form a cabinet to last until March, just a couple of months. 
but it needed to be fast because New Year's Day was looming. He commented personally that he'd rather be in a position to take six months rest, which is a pretty standard feeling most of us have around Christmas, but I imagine doubly so if you're trying to be both the Premier of a state and seemingly soon to be the Prime Minister of a nation too simultaneously. Turns out Hopeton wasn't the only delusional person around because Lyon was confident he could get this done in just a couple of days. All he needed was to get the advice of other state premiers on how to form a cabinet, and their advice was simple. Don't. Just give up. William Lyon, however, just couldn't give in that easily. He decided to try his best, to the point where he asked the Governor General twice for an extension on the deadline, but it seemed that it just wasn't going to happen. Barton had just refused outright, and Deacon had also convinced others just not to join. Edmund Barton wasn't just the obvious choice, he was the only choice, because he was a Federalist and Lyne wasn't. It was December 24th, Christmas Eve, when Lyne eventually admitted that he just was not going to manage to form a government. He advised the Governor General that he should call for Barton instead. Edmund Barton was then given the most wonderful Christmas present anyone's ever received, the nomination to create Australia's first federal ministry. Santa can't compete with that, all he's got is indentured servants with small hands and pointy ears to make toys. Barton announced his cabinet and it was a Merry Christmas indeed, just in time for New Year's Day as well, which was just around the corner. And what about William Lyne? Well, he decided that Federation wasn't so bad after all, and was even gifted a prestigious role in Barton's cabinet. He was the Minister for Home Affairs! Wow! <laughs> it's better than socks! Though, side note, I do genuinely enjoy socks. Like, I have a sock subscription, the Awesome Sock Club, by the way, not sponsored, and I spend more on socks than any other form of clothing, hence why I'm wearing the same limited rotation of shirts when I started Ozpol Explained four years ago. Still the same shirts. Anyway, back to politics. With that sorted, the first election happened at the end of March, and... What do you know, Edmund Barton would retain the position of Prime Minister until his resignation in 1903 to become one of the first Justices of the High Court. And what of Lord Hopeton? He went back to the UK in 1902 and became the Secretary for Scotland. There's nothing interesting there. There's no fun facts. We're moving on. And there you have it. That is the end of our story of a political controversy from the very birth of Australia as a nation, an ill-informed foreign aristocrat, a twist of fate, and a man who tried his best to prevent the office of Prime Minister from even existing, got offered the very first job as Prime Minister. Well, that's all from me. I'm going to have a nice sort of Christmas mug of tea, and I hope you all have a wonderful time. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed it. Share, subscribe, comment down below if you knew who the first Prime Minister of Australia actually was before I told you it was Edmund Barton. And of course, thank you so much to my supporters on Patreon who are giving me the gift of money for Christmas, which is almost as good as socks or a ministerial portfolio in the federal cabinet. Hey, Albo, that's all from me. I'll see you next year.